David Simon's alternate history miniseries, The Plot Against America, just finished its six-episode run on HBO. And I, Riley Chow Gold Derby, am here with actor Anthony Boyle. Now, you actually studied David Simon's The Wire in school, so I'm wondering how that education held up uh, when you're actually working on a David Simon show. Uh, what did your schooling get right or wrong? Um, they got a lot wrong. No money's joking. They, uh, they got a lot right. But um, it was kind of strange, you know, because we, we were shown the wire has been the, the pinnacle of TV in our second year. We were doing like a second year of drama school. We were doing this, um, you know, screen class where we would study the scenes and look at Dominic West and look at David and Ed's writing. And um, when a script came through to to be a part of something that they were making, I was, um, I sort of thought, well, I have to do this. You know, I've, I've been in a way training for it for, for years. Um, what do they get right? I think what what they often get right in their scripts is because they're so methodic about how they research and how they sort of they know every little nook and cranny of what's happening in the script down to the T of what matches a character would use to strike a cigarette that'll be period correct. That you sometimes think that maybe it's going to be so analytical that they won't have so much, you know, emotion invested in it. But the the amount of love that's poured into the script, into every scene, into li every little syllable, is so apparent when you get it and you get another draft and another draft and another draft and, you know, they've had a, arguments between each other about what comma will be put in or should it be a full stop. And once you sort of, you get to see it from behind the the wizard's curtain, there's, um, there's so much more going on than just, oh, here's just a normal script, you know? <laughs> Okay, so this show is based on uh, the Philip Roth book, uh, which you've read. So I'm wondering what conversations you had with the writers and producers about kind of what to disregard from the book because they were going to be approaching your character in a different way. Well, it's sort of, it's interesting because Alvin in the book, there's a large part where he's just left alone. And, you know, the book is viewed through the eyes of a seven-year-old boy or something. So Alvin is on the peripheral and you don't really know what's going on. You only hear a little trips of information. But what Ed and David had the license to do with the miniseries is to really just go on that journey with Alvin and Evelyn and um, really just sort of go into their world and see what was happening. And uh, we didn't have too many conversations about, I didn't have too many conversations about the book versus the script. I sort of took the book because there's so many amazing things. I mean, the, the, there's one moment where Roth describes Alvin as as an ape that's came down from the trees and somehow landed in Newark, New Jersey, uh, emotionally the rawest of the raw. And there's just so many gems like that that you can't throw away because once you've heard it, it's in there. But I think we were we were very much because Alvin wasn't too much in the book. We could sort of imprint our own thing on him. And I sort of just felt like the script then became the Bible and it became just a thing on its own. Um, so I wasn't reverting back to the book too much, but um, yeah, I sort of, I sort of just went with the script on that one. There's one episode where things are kind of going along, and then there are like ten seconds left, and suddenly Alvin is missing a leg. So I'm wondering if there were additional scenes uh, that maybe you shot that ended up on the cutting room floor, or if maybe that's just one of those cases like you were just talking about, where you know the show and the story can kind of exist without Alvin for a bit. I I feel like I can't say this because I heard David Simon say it in a podcast. Um, scenes were written, but then um, they were taken out for various reasons that David Simon said in a podcast. But I can't say it because I'm not David Simon. But yeah, there was there was there was more to that. There was more to that story, um, but unfortunately, it was it was cut. Okay, uh, is Alvin a real person? I couldn't figure out because the you know the real Philip Roth. He's kind of writing uh, the story as if he's a child in this alternate history. But was Alvin yeah, like a real relative of his? I, I didn't look into that at all. I just, as I said, I took a few things from the book, but just mostly just worked off our um, our script and just really focused on what David and Ed were writing. Okay, the FBI, they tail Alvin because he's marked as a potential communist. Uh, so why is that? And did you find anything in your research about how that was such a thing? Yeah, I mean, there's so many people that sort of drove out of um, 
of their communities. I, th I think what was what was um what was more interesting about all that was just like hard. Yes, it was framed in sort of the forties, and it was a, a Jewish community. But when you looked at it universally, when you see the stories that are are being told during the series, they could be anywhere in the world, you know. And I thought that that was that was one of the most interesting things for me. Uh, now that we've actually seen the whole show, or at least we will have by the time this uh, interview comes out, can you break down Alvin's arc? Uh, because he kind of has the fullest arc of the show, I would say, in terms of kind of traditional uh, fiction structure. Uh, how does he come into this, and how does he leave a different person based on his experiences? Well, he you first meet him, and he's this sort of wayward kid um, who's getting up to mischief and hanging around with Shushi and a couple of his little sort of mates from the street and they're getting up to mischief and doing sort of petty crimes for whatever reason. But underneath all of that, I think what separates Alvin from the rest of those lads is his moral compass. He has a really strong moral compass that, you know, even if he's going to get a leg blown off or even if he's going to go to jail for something, if he thinks it's right, he's going to do it. If he's going to go and assault people, even though that's wrong in the eyes of the law and his moral code and his moral compass, he thinks that's right. And um, I think out of anyone in the in the piece, he could be the most truthful because everyone else is trying to protect or trying to step on eggshells or trying to uh, manipulate someone through some way. But he's he's really he's living his truth um, to the best of his ability in the first three episodes. Um, and I think war changes him. I think I, I spoke a lot with this lad who um, had lost his leg in Iraq. Um, not just about the physical problems that that would bring, moving around and stuff, but the emotional problems that that would bring, um, shame, embarrassment. And when I, when I met with him, it really made me um, see the last three episodes very differently. Uh, Alvin, I think, ends up becoming a sort of opportunist um, with his relationship with um, Minna. And I think he sort of manipulates her because he sees that her father has prospects for him and is, is very rich. And he uses that relationship to then become this, what we see him in that last scene, is... Um, Steinem, you know, the, the, who he sort of rebelled against and, and hated in the second episode. I think in that last scene, he, he comes in in those flashy suits and he's talking about money and all these things that he, he, that he rails against in the second episode when he speaks to him and before Bess comes in with the promotion. And um, I think when you speak about that arc, I think that's, that's a pretty full arc, you know. He, he wants to rebel against this thing that he ultimately becomes. Um, I think it's very tragic. It reminded me of the inspiration for a show of one of David's others called Show Me a Hero. I think it's is it, um, Show Me a Hero and I'll Write You a Tragedy. I really felt that with Alvin's arc and Alvin's storyline that you know he, he he tries to be a hero. He he wants to go for what's right for whatever reason and ends up maybe one of the most tragic characters in it. Yeah, that's uh, that's all pretty weighty. Uh, what would you say was the most challenging aspect of this role for you? Um, it was my first time doing an American job, so like I was constantly a bit um, worried about the accent. I was I was worried that people were going to say, you know, he's he can't do an American accent very well. Um, but the most challenging was probably when we shot all the stuff from episode four to six. I had um, a sort of thing that we found online, like a leg brace, and then I would get one of the medics to roll up my ankle so there was no, um, so the joints wouldn't move. So it was just completely straight. So from morning, noon, and night, it was just so frustrating trying to trying to move around and get around. Um, that was that was challenging to try and, but it was it was good because it it made me feel what Alvin would feel, um, just that frustration and constant sort of anger um but to be honest like 
with, with the script this good and HPO behind it, it's like there wasn't really anything that was really challenging because they just they supported you in such a way that that you you couldn't really um you couldn't have asked for a better team. So it wasn't as if um you know there was like a diva or something on set that was that was getting in the way. It was just it was just it was really sort of an easy job. You know, it was, it was a joy to go to work. You mentioned the accent. Were there any uh, words that stood out to you? Yeah, man, I couldn't say, because um, I'd, I'd never heard this word, I'd only seen it written, um, Maryland. I kept saying Maryland, and they were like, that's not right. And then I couldn't get it in my head that, it, that Maryland was Maryland, because I'd only seen the word written. That was the word that really, that really annoyed me. Um, but other than that, no, I think, I think we were pretty good. All right. Uh, what were your uh, takeaways in terms of the culture and uh, the time period that the show takes place in? It was really cool, man. Like, I, I sort of was accidentally embedded in Jewish culture a year before we started. I was doing a play on Broadway, and there was I had like five Jewish mothers on that show. Um, Katie Kreisler, one of the actresses who would get me matzo ball soup when I felt sick. And and I and I really started to to feel that the, the Jewish culture was a lot like Irish culture in um the respect of the big families and very caring and very loving. But it was really interesting to dive into it more deeply um with with this. You know, I, I went and I done my first Passover and um we we read all these speeches about immigration and I just loved it. I thought it was just so rich and, and beautiful and very family oriented. In terms of the time period, I didn't try to look too much into that because I didn't want to get trapped into walking like someone who's in a period drama or sitting like someone's in a period drama. I just tried to, I just tried to be Alvin as much as possible and not break the accent and just stay in it and just, I don't know, just live each scene as it was coming to me and just try and behave truthfully, really. So this interview is part of your Emmy campaigning for a uh, nomination for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Limited Series or Movie. Uh, but with you being the first male in the credits, uh, why not submit in leads like your co-star Morgan Spector? Um, I haven't got a clue about any of that, man. Yeah. <laughs> I've just been asked to do interviews and I'm, I'm good at the interviews. Um, I don't get to choose who's in the credits. I, I, I don't know, man. Although I like the credits are pretty cool, though. I like, I like the start of them. Yeah. Uh, so you actually did another webcam interview uh, a couple weeks ago. And when you came on, the host, he asked how you are. And you're like, oh, yeah, things are great. I just went vegan, uh, which I was not expecting. And yeah. then there was just no follow up from the interviewer, which I get because, you know, sometimes you just want to stick to the script. Yeah. So, yeah, you're fantastic in Plot Against America. But, yeah, I was wondering if you could actually uh, expand on that. So my brother is a vegan. He's been vegetarian for like seven years or something. And he went vegan like two years ago. And I could never really do it because I love milk. And um, I used to drink pints of milk as a young boy. Um, but he came back and because we're all in quarantine and we're all sort of stuck in the same house with one another, I just thought it would be a good thing to try. Um, and it's been going well so far. It's been really good. I feel, um, I feel like I've got more energy. I don't know if I'll stick to it, uh, I must admit. Um, maybe go back to being vegetarian or something. But it's, uh, yeah, it's good. I would urge everyone to give it a go for uh, a week. It's been, um, it's been good fun and we're all trying to make stuff and yeah. Okay, so that chat was also kind of uh, derailed by uh, Tiger King because you yeah. said that it was the, uh, you know, the best piece of art that you had seen in years, the best documentary that you'd ever seen. So I wanted to bring it up and ask if you actually had watched the bonus episode yet. No, I didn't watch that one because I think it was sort of, I, I saw it advertised by a guy in the documentary that I didn't like. I didn't want to put money in that guy's pocket, so I went, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the episodes that we've got. I went back and watched the Louis Theroux documentary on the BBC with Joe Exotic. Um, I just thought it was incredible. It's, it's very rare that 
I'm in my family search at the minute. My 15 year old sister, my 29 year old brother, and my mom and dad can all sit down and watch something that's seven hours long or whatever, and all enjoy it and all feel a part of it and all have conversations and different opinions. And I just thought the Tiger King was just, it just gave us that. It, it, it just made three nights of, of the quarantine just go a little bit easier. And I thought that was a bit of a godsend, you know? Yeah. All right, Anthony. Uh, well, thanks very much for taking the time to chat to our viewers. You can log on to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. And we also have other chats with people from Fought Against America on our YouTube channel. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cheers.